Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Nick Campbell. Nick, welcome. Thanks so much, Michael. Hey, Nick. Um, I'm really excited for this. Uh, so you are an MIT graduate, uh, a speaker, and adjunct law school professor. Uh, you lead a, a bespoke advisory firm focused on strengthening social sector infrastructure, design the areas of governance, grant making, and management. And you work very closely with philanthropies, NGOs, uh, social enterprises to manage risk and uh, and crisis uh, in these areas. So why don't we start off and just kind of tell us like how did you get into this whole world before you actually started your your consult consulting consultancy uh, consulting firm? What what were you doing? Like just kind of take us back to the beginning or the early days. Yeah, sure. So I sort of fell into nonprofit work, uh, exempt, working with exempt organizations, as many um, usually say they, they have as well. I started a private practice as a lawyer, I was a tax attorney, and I thought that that's what I was going to do, focus on M&A deals and all kinds of for-profit uh, structurings. And instead, I was able to start working with nonprofits. Uh, a more senior attorney was leaving the firm and asked me to take over a lot of her matters. And they were all with nonprofits and exempt organizations. And so I sort of fell into the world of nonprofits and realized that I really enjoyed it. I was getting intellectually challenged. I loved what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I really felt like I was helping organizations and individuals have really significant impact throughout the world. And so I focused really exclusively on public charities, private foundations, and social welfare organizations, as well as other exempt organizations. After a while, I got really interested about what was happening on the other side of the desk, so to speak, like what was making our clients come to us and ask for legal advice. And I went over to a firm a client on secondment for a year, and that was a large community foundation, the New York Community Trust, and went over as associate general counsel. And that's when I really realized what it meant to be a part of a team in-house um, and not sort of be on that assembly line feeling that you would get at, at a firm. And I did that for a year and wanted to find out what it, what it was like on a global scale and went over to the Open Society Foundations, which is George Soros' philanthropy and was there for about seven years uh, as deputy general counsel and secretary of many organizations within the Open Society Foundations. I had a focus on the United States, Latin America and the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan Africa and focused exactly on operations, grant making, uh, structuring all over the world. And uh, after about seven years, I wanted to really wear those hybrid roles uh, Formally, and that's when I went over to Dalio Philanthropies as their senior director of operations and foundation counsel. And so wore both that general counsel hat as well as operations hat and really uh, focused on building out the philanthropic enterprise there, just as I had done with the Open Society Foundations, but on a much uh, different scale. So I've been You're, doing it for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, no, you have. I mean, it's amazing that they, as I've gotten to know you, um over the last couple of years or, or so now it, it, like it's amazing how driven you are and and especially when you just kind of went through where you've come from from kind of the the background in terms of of school and then career wise take us back like, even even before that's the early days like what do, what do you think created this drive within you uh just paint the picture for us of like your upbringing a little bit and if, if there's anything that you think that in those early years really kind of set the stage for uh, the drive that you have to, to power through these prestigious schools uh, and very well-known organizations? Mm -hmm. I think it definitely, uh, it was my parents. They were both very focused on education and excellence. And so they had this mindset of whatever you step into, you step into with excellence. And I've just followed that mantra and that mindset throughout my entire life, both personally and professionally. So it carried me, you know, through growing up. Uh, we lived in the Cayman Islands and then moved to uh, Barbados and then over to the United States. And in each instance, I had to step into a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new set of friends, a new set of, a new set of um, uh, learning opportunities and education. And in each instance, each environment, you're taking those principles with you, which is you step into everything you go into with excellence um, and you just keep going until you get there. Tell me more about that. I, I want to dig a little bit deeper. Like when you say that your parents taught you about excellence, 
Um, I mean, both both you and I are we have we have young kids uh, right now. I, like, I just I'd love to hear a little bit more about what what they did. Like, how do they actually teach you excellence? How do they demonstrate that for you? And then how are you maybe teaching that to your kids right now? Uh, one, so that I can just you know uh, selfishly <laughs> maybe maybe apply that as well. But I think many people just listening, even if their kids are older, they don't have kids that we can all benefit from focusing on on excellence and applying that. Mm -hmm. I think it was a lot of um, learning by example. My father, you know, we, they were from Barbados. We were all born in Barbados. And, you know, he came from a very poor family, um, poor environment, and he was still able to win scholarships to go to college. Um, and he wanted to travel the world. And so again, that this thinking of coming from a very poor environment, um, you know, um, and really thinking about what else is out there and how you can continue your education. And so he was able to get a scholarship, go to uh, college, start teaching really uh, with throughout the Caribbean. And my mother, the same way, you know, she was a nurse and then won her scholarship to uh, go and train in other islands uh, within the Caribbean. And so they both had this love of adventure, of trying new things and really saying, whenever we step into something, we're going to do it well. So I learned it just by watching them. And then whenever I did anything, uh, if I got a 98 on a test, it was you know, this is amazing, you know, you celebrate your wins, but then also saying, okay, how could we get better at the remaining two? And I, and I hear about those stories where people are essentially saying, well, yes, you got the 98, but not even recognizing that and focusing on the two that you missed. And instead, what they did a really good job of was celebrating the wins and then saying, how can we continue to step into excellence? So it was both by watching them, but also in how they um, approached my own education and just even in engaging with other people, knowing that you can learn from other people, no matter like where they're from, what their backgrounds are. And uh, just putting that all into uh, play, I think really uh, set me up for on that path of whenever I step into something, I'm going to go at it with excellence, with diligence, and really invest both my time and energy to make sure that I'm, I'm achieving the best results I can. Yeah, that's really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. So I think it was February 2019 that you started uh, Build Up Advisory Group, which is your consultancy. Um, why? I mean, you, you here you're working in some very well-known, prestigious um, organizations. Uh, I'm guessing that your pay was was nothing to sneeze at, um, and you were doing great work. Like, why did you decide to to step out? What kind of caused you to feel, yeah, you know, I should I should leave everything that I, I have here and go off and start something uh, myself. I'm so sorry, Michael. This is my daughter. All good, so. yeah. <laughs> um, but the it's it's really for for her, right? For her, uh, her being Caden and um, my younger daughter Nova. I wanted to get more flexibility, and I wanted that in two main ways. One is with my family because I wanted the ability to be around in the middle of the day if I if I needed to for them. I wanted to be present for them in a way that I didn't think I could within a structure that was not my own. The second was to have flexibility around the kinds of work that I did, uh, the kinds of uh, projects that I worked on, and the kinds of organizations and individuals I did that work with. So in my practice, what I really pride myself on, on doing is working only with brave organizations, brave nonprofits and philanthropies that are trying to affect social change throughout the world. And so I thought about what would it feel like to have that kind of flexibility to pick and choose what I worked on and who I worked with. And that's when I said, well, what would it, what would it look like if I created something of my own? Yeah, you know, I, I, sh I remember, Nick, that um, back in one of our like weekly clarity coaching calls um, that, that you, you know, you recognize the importance of, of marketing your business, doing follow up, like the whole prospecting thing. But I remember at one point you said, like, you just kind of felt like you were getting a bit stuck, right? Like you knew you need to do it, but you weren't always getting it done. Uh, and I asked you, like, why are you doing what you're doing? Like, what's really driving you? Why did you leave the corporate world and, and start this whole thing? And you said just that. It's like, I did it for my kids, like really to be with them, to be have greater flexibility. Um, do you remember that call? Do you remember that kind of conversation? Oh, I, I remember it uh, clearly. Uh, it was really the turning point. One of the, 
one of the turning points for me because when you said like you have to think about that and immediately they came to mind like I'm doing this for my family they are depending on me in that way and so it just crystallized everything for me and really said to me yes there's the work of the thing there's the client work that you have to do but there's also the building of the business there's the building of this lifestyle that you said that you wanted to create for you and your family so every time that you decide not to do something or you don't feel like doing outreach you're you're moving away further and further from that dream yeah and that's really really important i think for everyone to hear because uh we all face uh challenge around doing things that we're not uh, excited to do, right? They feel uncomfortable, like venturing into that new territory. And for a lot of people that marketing, selling, you know, their services or kind of just getting out there, prospecting, right? Reaching out to clients is not the most enjoyable area, right? Most consultants are very good at what they do. They're experts, but they're not necessarily marketers or don't enjoy that, that part of it. Uh, but yeah, you, I mean, it's, you, you really grasp onto that concept. So for everyone listening, watching, just, you know, really think about like, why are you doing what, what you're doing, right? Was the, what's the reason that you got into running your consulting business? What's your goal? What are you doing it for? Uh, and hopefully you'll, in thinking about that, that'll kind of be the, the impetus and, and a bit of, um, push for you to, to continue working towards that direction. So let's kind of come back then, Nick, you know, you, you launched your business in February, 2019, uh, when you started, when you made that transition, what what surprised you or what did you find most challenging in the early days? I think what was surprising to me was what ended up being uh, more of the focus and a, a bit more challenging. So I think when you think about starting a consulting practice or a business, you think about how am I going to get clients? Like, how am I going to be able to build a business? And so I was really focused on how many clients I would be able to get. Um, would I be able to get clients? Could it be a, a feasible thing? And when I got started, the clients actually came a lot easier than I thought. Like that was not the challenge. The challenge was in addition to doing uh, client work, can you also build your business? Can you also do the marketing? Can you also do the outreach? Can you also do the behind the scenes running of an entire organization that is really completely up to you? And so it was surprising to me that that became actually the focus and that was much more challenging than trying to go out and, and find clients. So, I mean, a lot of the work that you do is, is in the quote unquote kind of like nonprofit space. And I think a lot of consultants um, or, or just, you know, experts that uh, are working in nonprofit have a background or a passionate um, in that space, uh, come up with the, the kind of the saying or, the, or have the belief, I should say, that nonprofit equals less money, right? It's not as quote unquote lucrative. Yet, I know for you and, and many of our other clients who work in those spaces around governance or nonprofits or fundraising, it's, it can actually be very lucrative. It can, you know, you can still have um, a, a very, uh, you know, like a high income business. Um, just any thoughts that you have, like your experiences for someone who might be saying to themselves, yeah, I want to work in nonprofit. That's my passion or that's my, my background. But uh, I always hear that nonprofits like don't spend money. What, what advice would you offer them or what might you say just based on your experience? You have to be clear on the kinds of nonprofits that you're working with because that that category of nonprofits is actually a very big category of organizations. There's lots of different types of nonprofit organizations. There are you know, hospitals that are nonprofit organizations and they're multi-billion dollar enterprises. And then there are the very local place-based nonprofits that are that may have a budget of 5,000 um, for the organization. So I think it, it, you have to be very clear on the kinds of nonprofits that you want to work with, and then the kind of value that you want to offer to them or that you can offer uh, to them. So I think that once you, you know, nonprofit is just like any other organization in that if you offer them something of value, they're, they're able to then say, here's the, um, the investment that we're willing to make in order to receive that value. And I've um, been able to work very closely with uh, nonprofit organizations. I work almost primarily with grant making organizations and I'm very clear on the value that I can provide to those organizations. So I think just getting clear on what are their needs and what's the value that you can provide to them will help you um, clarify, okay, these are the kinds of nonprofit organizations that I'll be able to work with. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you joined our Clarity Coaching Program, I believe last summer. 
Um, and your business has, has grown tremendously since then. I mean, it's just been amazing seeing what, what you've created and, and the work that you've put in and the results you've been able to achieve. What, what would you say like has really helped you to create that, the level of, uh, of outcome and growth in, in your business? When you kind of think about everything that you've, you've learned, that you've applied, kind of where you are today, what, what would you say is kind of like the, the main focus or has had the biggest impact in you being able to, to achieve that level of result and success? That's a really good question. I think it, it has one definitely been me being a member of the program and being a part of that community of people who are thinking similarly, they're all consultants. And so a lot of the challenges that you have, even though they're in different industries, they have similar challenges. I think it's also definitely been the coaching that I've received from you and Sam. Um, and I, I know like you always say this, but imperfect action. That has really been huge, particularly for me, because I'm not one of those people that comes up with an idea and I'm just off running before the idea is even fully formed. I can come up with ideas. I'm really creative that way, but I'm also very method methodical. So I need to then say, okay, what comes next and next and that, you know, like I need to plan that out and just sometimes saying no, just in perfect action, get it out there and see what happens has been really, really instrumental and critical to my growth. Love it. Yeah. Um, so you have, as we, as we kind of talked about, um, you know, before even hitting record, you have kids at home, right? And uh, there are distractions that, that everyone who's working from home deals with. Uh, how do you structure your, your day, Nick? You know, for, for people who, because I, I always see, I mean, some people say like, yeah, I don't have enough time. I can't get things done. Yet we all have 24 hours in a day, right? So some people are able to achieve a lot more to make more progress in their business than, than others. How do you kind of think about your, your daily routine, your habits, uh, and how do you actually structure your, your day to ensure that you can be productive and, and continue to grow the business? So you can likely hear my daughter in the background who is frustrated with, uh, rem with uh, remote school. Um, <laughs> so this is definitely a constant in the household. And luckily, my husband is able to um, spend a lot of time with, my, with both of my daughters. And so that frees me up to do a lot of the work. But in addition to that, it's a lot of planning and scheduling. So even before I start the week, and you know, you and I have definitely had conversations about this, particularly earlier on in my um, consulting journey. But I start before the week begins, I plan it out and I look at all the upcoming meetings, see how I have to prepare, um, and I plan those things out. I also determine on a weekly basis what my weekly goal is, and then what are the three things that I want to accomplish each of those days. I also block out um, a couple of days a week to focus exclusively on the business. So that means that I'm not taking any client calls, um, any other calls, any partner calls on those two days. Sometimes it happens because there's emergency situations that come up and I'll jump on a call or there's scheduling um, issues, but it's pretty rare. Um, so those two days are carved out for me to just really focus and do work. And then the other three days, I have times blocked off where I take calls because otherwise what I was finding in the very beginning was when it's your own schedule, um, you can literally be on phone calls every single day of the week for multiple hours. And then you start having questions about when will I do my work? When will I build a business? When will I go out and market and just share some value with people who I may not be working with, but I want to share that value with them. So I'm a planner by nature. I'm pretty organized, but uh, I think just planning the week ahead of time has been incredible um, to making sure that I uh, am able to accomplish the weekly goals and the daily goals that I set for myself. Let's also then talk a little bit about, I think, another area that maybe has contributed uh, to, to your growth or at least supported it. And I'd love to get your perspective, which is building a team, right? So you've kind of started to to add people or, or you know assistants and so forth. Just talk us through like kind of what you've done and what your thought process has been or or any mindset shifts that you've had in regards to you know building a team and, and having people to enable you to continue to see growth. Yeah, so I know that uh, a lot of people, I think, at least when they own businesses, they struggle with delegating and giving things up. Like day one, I was like, who could I delegate to? Um, that was really my thought. Uh, I, you know, by that point, worked in large organizations, smaller organizations, where I knew that once we had a team, we could get so much more done. And I wanted to build a team, but I also wanted to be responsible about building that team. 
And so I know that I needed to bring on a person or other team members uh, when I had enough work to sustain that. And so I really just worked uh, in the business, on the business to hit some pain points because I wanted to see what it felt like to do my own books, to um, you know do my own scheduling, all of those different pieces that I then ended up delegating out um, to other people. I wanted to feel what it was like. And I also wanted to understand it so I could explain it to others and be able to have intelligent conversations with them. So the first person that I brought on board was um, an assistant who's still with me now. And it was, I mean, it, once I brought her on, I was able to 10X the amount of work that I could get done, the amount of things I could get done. Um, her talents really complemented mine and her skill set really complemented mine. So where I was not as great, she was stellar. And so it, it really, when I brought her on, I was able to do so much more. And what, what kind of things is, is she doing for you? Just so everyone can have a sense of like, what, what was the low hanging fruit that you, you delegated to her as quickly mm -hmm. as you could that really freed you up to, uh, to spend more time on the high value tasks in the business? Yes, it was scheduling. It was doing first drafts of things. So even saying, oh, thanks so much for these comments. I'll put them into the agreement or I'll put them into the document. Doing those types of tasks which, where you think, oh, this is not going to take a lot of time. I'll just, you know, I'll knock this out in 15 minutes. And then 35 minutes later, you're like, oh, I'm done. And you think again, oh, that didn't take a lot of time, but you have right. to multiply that out. And so just being able to say, can you handle my calendar? Can you handle all my scheduling? Can you, you know, somebody says, hey, we have time to meet. Then I just copy her in and she takes it from there. Um, being able to handle social media posting, um, marketing. Uh, again, I'm coming up with the content, but I'm also brainstorming with her because again, she's really good at social media strategy and, um, and knows what's out there and is able to say, oh, let's think about this together. Um, and then being able to implement because I think execution, it, it, once when it's just you, it can be pretty difficult um, and you can delay things, but she was able to just really step in very quickly and help with a lot of execution. Awesome. And, and just kind of talk us through a little bit of what you're looking and thinking about now in terms of team, any other team members uh, in play, any kind of future hires that you see, just what are your thoughts in terms of the team going forward and, and what you're looking at? Yes. So my assistant is now um, going to become um, an employee and she is uh, my program coordinator now. And that really means that she focuses on project management, um, on doing a, a lot of the partner outreach and engagement, um, joining me on client calls, helping out with check-ins and um, strategy check-ins and accountability check-ins with my clients. So doing a lot more of the substantive lifting. And so what happens now is we have a, a need for someone who's focused on relationships and operations. So we're thinking of like a relationships and operations assistant or associate who can do the calendar and do the scheduling for the entire organization, not just me, um, helping out with the operational tasks that come up, um, helping out with the client asks that come up as well. Uh, so that's definitely an immediate need. And then um, bringing on an attorney who is really familiar with nonprofits and uh, philanthropies and having the ability to both advise from a legal perspective, but also um, from an operational perspective as well, which is actually going to be quite hard because usually you find one or the other lawyers who can, you know, uh, advise on the operational pieces, but they really just want to do operations. They don't want to do the marking up of agreements and things like that, or you mm -hmm. find the reverse. So those are the two critical hires that, yeah. that I have next. And that happen, that should happen within the first quarter of next year. And and with the lawyer, I mean, is that like a, a strategic move in terms of, are, are you, is that to, to work in projects that you've already been delivering on? Or is this that you see a new opportunity to add additional value for clients that you haven't really been able to to address uh, without having a, a quote unquote kind of practicing lawyer. So I, I thought initially that that was going to be the case that I would really be focused on the consulting arm or advisory arm only and sort of do an add on for legal advice and counsel as it came up. But what has happened actually is the legal advice and counsel piece has really grown because the, the kinds of experience that I bring to the conversation 
is really based on that intersection of operations, strategy, legal, um, and programmatic approach that I don't think a lot of my clients um, and organizations within the sector generally they see. And so they're very attracted by it. They're attracted by our model. And so the legal services, like through our general counsel retainer has grown quite significantly, as well as um, our consulting services as well. So I want someone who can really go back and forth between the two worlds really yeah. nicely. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, how have you seen your pricing kind of, you know, the pricing model, pricing strategy shift or, or change over the last 12 months or so? Like as a business has started to, to, you know, kind of mature and, and grow, uh, you're building the team, any big changes that you've made to, to pricing? Like, have you increased prices? Have you changed your pricing model? Um, any, any kind of insights or experiences that you can share? Mm -hmm. I have definitely increased uh, my model, my pricing model, but I've also clarified my offerings. So mm -hmm. I think that once I was very clear on, I do this, this, and this, it was very easy to raise uh, the investment level because people saw very quickly, oh, that's the value I'm getting. So mm -hmm. they were able to see the offerings, hold them, so to speak, and say, of course, I'd pay you this amount because the amount of value that I'm receiving, I mean, it's enormous. So I think it was a combination of raising my prices, but also at the same time, clarifying uh, the offerings that I provide. And what would you say has uh, helped you the most to clarify your, your offers? And was it conversations that you've had or uh, for someone who might be in a similar position where they're doing good work, so, you know, the business is growing, things are going in the right direction, uh, or maybe they've plateaued, whatever their, their situation is, but they may, they may feel like a little bit murky around their offerings. What would you say, because I know you have definitely dialed in your offerings, you're much clearer, right? Which has led to more confidence and therefore increasing prices um, and better communications with, with clients mm -hmm. around what you're offering. What do you think has been the biggest factor or what did you actually do in the business to help you to become clear around the offerings? I talk to my ideal clients. I talk to people who were within organizations that were ideal nonprofits and philanthropies for the work that I was doing. And I, I really just talked to them to find out their needs, the questions that were coming up, the things that they were struggling with, uh, just to understand how they were perceiving uh, things happening within the sector, as well as within their or own organization. So it was a combination of those kinds of conversations, as well as discovery calls where you're talking with people and you're hearing the same um, pain points over and over again, you start to realize, okay, this is a thing. Um, and once you pinpoint what that is and then start to massage it and, and, and share it back with people, right? And say, I'm hearing this and this is how we've done it before. You see what resonates. And from there, it was really easy to start to mold it a lot better. I thought that when I started, I would just be very clear. I thought I was very clear, but then you realize even within a niche, like I just focus on organizational infrastructure with nonprofits and philanthropies, there's a ton of things that I could be doing. And so just even saying, okay, let's knock that down to three offerings um, within the consulting arm and then three offerings within the uh, legal arm, that has actually helped a lot because it also allows you to start saying no um, right. You're very clear, your marketing, all of those things sort of feed into it. But I think like once you start to have more conversations, then it, it becomes a lot clearer about what you should be offering. One thing, uh, Nick, that people would uh, recognize, I think, pretty quickly if they're connected with you on LinkedIn or following you on LinkedIn is that you post a lot of videos um, and you, you get some really great engagement on those videos. Just kind of Talk us through what, what that's done for your business or, or why you are so prolific in, in publishing videos on LinkedIn. So I, I will say that the idea, I know that we had talked about it within the program. And, you know, when people were talking about video and then you would see all these posts about video being the next big thing. I'm like, well, I don't know if that would work for me. But again, I'm always willing to try something and see if it would work. And so I said, OK, let's let's go for video, because in the sector, there's a lot of writing. And I found that just with my volume of work. It was hard to keep up the pace that I wanted to do my writing on, which was weekly. And I thought, well, maybe I can do videos and see how that goes. And it was, I mean, just the first video, just so well received and it just grew from there. And it's done a few things. One, it's, it has uh, made people very clear about my positioning 
um, my thoughts in the sector, my thoughts about nonprofits and philanthropies and how to build infrastructure. So when I get on discovery calls, my uh, rate of having that discovery call turn into a, a client engagement is really high because when they get on the call with me, they feel like they already know me because they've actually quoted things that I've said from the video and said, well, I know you think this way, or I really love this video and they feed it back to me. So they, we're aligned before we even have our first conversation, which I think is amazing. The other thing is it allows me to share value with people who may not be able to become my client for whatever reason. And I'm able to share lots of value and resources with them and they're able to engage. And so if someone asks a question in response to a video, then I respond and we're able to engage that way as well. So I'm constantly providing um, education and value to those who may not um, enter into a client engagement with me. And then the third is have actually gotten clients um, from those videos, right? Where people, again, it is one, I was talking about something that really resonated with them and they reached out about it. Or two, sometimes people think they know what you do, but they don't really know what you do. And so once they see the video and then a need comes up, they're like, oh, you were just talking about governance or you were just talking about grant making. I have a friend who is you know, focused on grant making or they have an issue with their board, could you, I'd love to put you all in touch. And that has happened uh, a few times and they've become clients. So it has, it's been really fun, first of all, but then it, it's really been rewarding as well. And, and to give people a, a sense, I mean, you, you haven't, this is not you publishing uh, one video here, one video there, just kind of seeing how it goes. You I mean, you've really made it a part of your routine and, and a habit uh, how often are, are you publishing? How many videos are, are going up, you know, within a, a period of a, of a month or so, typically? I post weekly. So it's called Fast Build Fridays. And so I post every Friday. And at this point, I've done about 37 of them. Um, so ever since I started, I've posted every week. And if I don't post, like, for example, when we're going to the holidays, I think things can get lost in the shuffle, but I still want to share value and be present. And what I'll do is I'm doing a flashback for a fast forward Friday. And so I'm pulling up a video from uh, previous months yeah. and playing that. So I'm still showing up every Friday. Nice. Flashback Friday. Here we come. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's that's right. yeah, fantastic. I mean, that consistency, right, is so important. Uh, and whether it's video or, or any other content uh, and just being present in front of your ideal clients, uh, it, it really is critical. So Nick, I, I want to sh uh, thank you so much again for sharing today uh, some of your your insights and a bit of your journey. It's, it's really been great. I also want to make sure that people can learn more about you and, and your work. Uh, so where's the best place for them to go? Sure. So first, thank you so much for having me, Michael. I really enjoyed the conversation. And our website is buildupadvisory.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn, A. Nicole Campbell, and on Twitter at Nick is building up. There we go. All right, Nick. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you.